In this video, I'm going to describe the whole process of setting up and running a model in the ANSYS Fluent PEMFC add-on module. I'm going to detail the geometry definition, then the meshing, then into the definition of the Fluent case file, and I'll describe some of the results at the end. This process can be quite tricky, especially the meshing. So I'm going to share a couple of tips that I've picked up along the way when I've worked with these simulations. Also, I'll share some troubleshooting advice that has been useful to me. Um, and a small disclaimer, this video is not intended as an expert opinion on the matter. This is a very basic tutorial just to get someone set up with the module because it can take quite a long time even just to get something running if you don't have anything to go by. So this is intended just as an introductory video and there's a lot of improvements that can be made onto what I'm doing now um, to make it more, give more accurate results um, and to be a more rigorous model. But without further ado, we can get into the geometry definition. I have Design Modeler open now and what you can see is an assembly that I've created. I made the parts separately and then this is the assembly. I've imported them, you can see on the left, imported the different parts and put them together using the move functions uh, in ANSYS Design Modeler. So this geometry is a single cell, so a lot of what's out there at the moment in tutorials are single channel models, so it'll just be one straight section. This is actually a full cell. Um, the extra complication of the geometry does add complication to the meshing and it makes the simulations a little bit harder to get working and that's why I want to share this video. So let's have a look at a couple of the elements which are included. So there's the two flow plates here which I've selected and I'm just going to hide those. And now we can see there are the two gas channels and they are, it's a serpentine flow plate so those two gas channels are defined and I'll hide those as well and then what's left now is the membrane electrode assembly with the GDL top and bottom the gas diffusion layers this MEA has a has microporous layers or MPL so that's an extra layer and we have the catalyst layer and then you have the membrane in the middle so that's the geometry definition coming over to the tree outline just to show how this is all put together so what I've done is I've taken all the individual parts you can see there these are all the pieces of the membrane electrode assembly there's the flow plate for the anode the cathode and the gas for the anode and the cathode what I'm gonna do this gasket was originally defined but it actually doesn't need to be there, but we're going to suppress that in the meshing stage. Anyway, what you need to do is select all of these parts and right click and create a, a single part to join them all together. These would all be separate bodies, so you join them all together into one part. What that does is it ensures that a conformal mesh is created when we go to our meshing later on. Um, Another important thing is down in the shared topology method, making sure that's set to automatic. And actually, you can define a shared topology here at the top. Um, again, automatic defined on the part that we made. Um, and that's kind of belt and braces. You could probably get away without defining that extra shared topology because it's defined in here. But while troubleshooting, I had to double check everything. And so I've, I keep that in normally. So that's defining the part. The next thing is uh, fluid solid definitions. So starting with the gas channel, that's defined as a fluid. So here on fluid solid in the details view, it's defined as a fluid. Obviously it's gas. So then the flow plates, they're both defined as solids. That makes sense as well. Um, and then these, these are called solids just because that's the automatic name that's given to them on the import. But every layer of the membrane electrode assembly should be defined as a fluid zone. And this is important because of how ANSYS Fluent interprets uh, the type of body it is for later on. So just make sure that these are defined as fluid. So the only thing that's defined as solid are the two flow plates. 
that is it for the geometry definition. Um, again, to reiterate, making sure there's no small gaps, making sure there's no overlaps, because both of those things are going to cause big problems. Um, and that's pretty much it. So we're going to move on to the meshing now. So when I've saved my assembly, I then will link it to the tutorial mesh block here. So just link it into the geometry and then open the meshing block. Mm. Now I'm in the meshing tab. So first thing I do is open up my part and just get this gasket, suppress it because we don't need it. Okay, then I'm going to add in a virtual topology. So all that does is I add it in, leave it default settings and add it. And you can see here virtual faces, virtual edges. It just simplifies the geometry, it simplifies some of the faces, some of the edges, and it makes it easier to mesh, basically. Um, and for a complicated geometry, that can sometimes be useful. Next, you see this connections tab. It's got a tick, that's great. But if there's anything defined underneath it, um, if there's like a, a tab beneath it and it says contacts, then you've probably gone wrong because the contacts are being defined probably because you haven't enabled topology sharing and it thinks that they're different parts. If you've defined it all as one part, you don't get contacts because there's no contacts between one part and itself. Um, so that connections tick beside it is good, but nothing should be underneath it. Next, mesh. Physics preference obviously should be CFD and Fluent if you're using Fluent. And now I'll go into how to define the mesh. This is quite tricky. It it is very it's a very important step, um, and the mesh that I define is that is quite coarse, um, just to get the simulations to run quickly, but. If you wanted to get really accurate results, it would be useful to define a mesh with upwards of a million or 1.5 million elements. Uh, the mesh I define will only have about 800,000. So a really important step to get started, follow what I've done here, but there's a lot of improvements and I'll, I'll mention some of them as I go. One piece of advice that I got when I was asking people about tips for meshing was to start at the most complicated part and work outwards and in this case the most complicated and most important part is right in at the membrane electrode assembly so that's what we're going to do so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to hide these two bodies and then i'm going to go to mesh show sweepable bodies so this will show all the bodies that are available to be swept and have a swept method defined for them so they're now selected. I'll make a create a method. I'm actually going to remove the the membrane from this. So I'll only have the microporous layers, the ca the catalyst layers, um, and that's it. So that's four bodies: microporous on either side and catalyst on either side. Because the flow uh, channels are imprinting onto the GDL, so on the top surface of the GDL. I'll show that now. If I hide this body, there's an imprint. If I go onto face select, when I did that topology sharing, it imprints these faces. And because of that, you cannot use a sweep method from the top to the bottom of the GDL. Um, and that's because it can't find a source and target face. Now, this is a downside. It would be ideal if you could sweep the GDL. To be honest, it's really just a problem with uh, ANSYS workbench meshing because it's it's trying to do a lot for you, but as it tries to do things for you, it is kind of restricting you a little bit. Um, so it's better really um, to maybe use another software package if you want to make a very, very highly structured mesh. Anyway, back to this. We've got our four bodies defined in our sweep method. Um, so we have to change the method to sweep and we'll use five divisions and that's all we need to change. I'm going to define all the other parts of the mesh and I will come back when I've done that. I now have the mesh defined and I'll just click through each element so you can pause the video and have a look at all the different settings I've used. 
So it's just sweet methods on those four bodies. I added one sweet method on the membrane, so it's a one layer sweep. Then body sizing on those four. I've added an inflation layer on the flow channels and it's on all of the external faces but not the inlet and outlet. I've also added a body sizing method to those two channels and I've added a body sizing method to the two GDL layers. Now that I have my mesh defined I can try and generate the mesh. So I just click generate. Now it fails um, and this is a problem that I encountered when I was trying to create my mesh first and there's a very simple workaround. I'm not sure why it's failing exactly but there's a very simple workaround and that is to select all the bodies use body select select all the bodies that are have sweep methods on them generate mesh on selected bodies so that's just going to generate the mesh there and then once that's been generated just generate the rest of the mesh from there and I'll come back when this is generated I now have the mesh generated um, so let's have a little bit of a closer look I've just put a section pane through it um, so we can start off right in close we can look at the MPL the CL and the membrane they all have a nice structured mesh uh, they have their sweeps and it's all quad elements then a little bit further out in the GDL layers it's uh, mostly tetrahedrons but these elements directly adjacent uh, to the MPL layers are pyramid elements they give a little bit more structure than a normal tetrahedron element then if we go a little bit further back and look at our gas channels we see they have the inflation layer on them the inflation layers have a method on them which is a first layer thickness you define the first layer thickness of the inflation layer without that method they tend to stretch out over near the membrane and get really big and then pinch in really close over here and um, in this particular geometry it's still happening a little bit you can see you can kind of make out the inflation layer here, whereas you can't here. But it's much less than it was when I did it without first layer thickness definition. So it's something that I would recommend. Uh, it's a fix for that little problem um, if it happens. So again, as I said before, it's quite a coarse mesh, but it's, it'll do for now. Really, it's just all about focusing in elements at the center and not really worrying too much about elements out at the sides where they don't matter. What I have open now is the manual, the ANSYS manual for the PEMFC add-on module. Um, and it's just, it talks about geometry definition for the model. Um, so it says you need a number of different physical zones uh, that have to be present in the mesh. And that's in the form of a named selection. So these will be anode flow channel, gas diffusion layer, and so on. They're listed there. Um, it's optional to have coolant channels and that sort of thing. In graphical form, here it is in the theory module. Sorry, in the theory manual, it's here. Um, so gas diffusion layer, microporous layer, catalyst layer. So we have all these already defined. We don't have coolant channels, but we have all these other layers defined. Um, it's just a matter of naming them uh, and, and creating name selections. So I'm going to go back into, into ANSYS meshing and we're going to define those name selections. So one trick when defining named selections is to just click select some body and then just hit N and that's a hotkey which opens up the name selection rather than right clicking and finding it in the menu. So this is the anode uh, current collector I'll call it. So it's the flow plate or the current collector. Um, so I just have CC. So I'll define all the rest of them uh, and I'll come back and just briefly show each one sped up. I now have all the physical zones defined uh, using name selections but there's a couple more things to do so there's a few faces that have to be defined such as the inlets the outlets and then the terminals 
um, and I'll go through these. So first of all, on the bottom side or the anode side, we will go into face selection mode and select that small circle there. So that's the anode inlet. So the same trick again, use N and then anode. And we're going to call it a mass flow inlet. We want it to be defined as a mass flow inlet. And using that type of definition where I explicitly say what it is, it'll automatically get picked up by Fluent, uh, which just makes it a little bit easier. So OK to that. Next, I go to the outlet. And this is going to be the anode. And I'm going to call it a pressure outlet, because that is what it's going to be defined as in Fluent. And that'll also automatically pick it up. I'll do the same for the other sides and come back. Now I need to find this outside surface as the anode terminal. So this is where the current is sort of, or the voltage is referenced to. Um, so it's as if I've connected, or I will be connecting the positive and negative terminals to this face and, and the other side on the cathode, so cathode terminal. And that is all of the definitions. That's all the name selections. One last thing is just to look at the statistics and just say there's 802,000 elements in this mesh. Um, and then also, if you were to start generating your own meshes, it's then good to start looking at the mesh metrics. So you can look into that yourself. There's lots of literature out there about minimum element quality and that sort of thing. I'm not going to go into it in this. So for now, the meshing is finished and we're going to save and then move on to setting up the Fluent case file. I've now updated my mesh and hooked it up to a Fluent file. So if I select edit on the setup, I should start it in double precision mode. And usually you can get away with four solver processes on most machines and it's already in three dimensions because it's a 3d mesh that's been loaded in so then you can just start those settings and wait for it to load up I'm now in fluent and the first thing I should look at is over here in the models tab you can see there is no PEM FC module so what I can do is it's included in any installation of ANSYS, but you just have to access it through the text user interface and load it in specially. So you do that by typing define, model, add-on, and it gives you a list of add-ons that are included. And one of them, number nine specifically, is the one we're looking for. So we type nine, enter, and it loads in all the different functions and, and definitions that it needs. Once we have that model loaded, you can see it it's here in the model tab now. So we'll go in, right click edit, enable. And there's quite a lot of different settings that you can have. Uh, there's a lot of parameters you can fill in. And then we'll go through how to set it all up. We're going to keep pretty much everything as the default values. Um, because really, to set up the parameters, it, it's all very specific to the the setup that you have. So we're just going to keep everything default. The one thing we are going to change is to t uncheck liquid phase. Um, this is going to speed up the calculations quite a bit. It just makes it easier for for it to solve because it's not solving for liquid phase water in the in the gas uh, channels or in the diffusion layers. So the parameters, we're going to leave everything but we're going to set up the anode side. So the whole anode side. So we'll start with the current collector. And these are our named selections that we made earlier. So the current collector is the anode CC. We just click it and then move on. So flow channel, anode channel, porous electrode, uh, that means GDL. Then the triple point boundary or the catalyst layer is the CL, catalyst layer, microporous, MPL. And we go to electrolyte. That's what our membrane is cathode same thing current collector flow channel porous electrode catalyst layer and microporous layer we're going to add in a contact resistivity uh, we're going to add in two so this is going to be uh, 
a resistance and an additional resistance because of an imperfect contact and the contact is the contact between the flow plate and the GDL so some part of that metal flow plate is going to be touching the, the gas diffusion layer and that contact is going to have a contact resistivity defined for it so it's the wall between the anode CC and the anode GDL so it's that wall and it's the cathode CC and the cathode GDL so those two walls typical value might be 1e to the minus 6 and use first value for all then the projected area that we have so in my case it's a 2.2 centimeters squared membrane so 484 0, 0, 0, 0, meters squared and then the terminal anode and cathode terminals those were the name selection faces we had to find earlier so that's the actual parameters of the model are all set up now so we can just apply those and it turns on for example it'll turn on the energy equation which is off by default um, and it'll it should set your turbulence model to a laminar flow um, it it's probably already that for default anyway we just hit OK and that's that set up next thing to do is just to check operating conditions so operating pressure this is important for fuel cells uh, I'm gonna leave it at atmospheric pressure so next is to set up boundary conditions um, so here we have our inlets and as we wanted to we, we define them as mass flow inlets or we named them and it's been automatically detected like we wanted so edit the anode mass flow inlet we just say normal to boundary and I'm going to use 1e minus 7 for the flow rate set it to 333 Kelvin 0 0.5 0 0.5 apply that and do the same on the cathode side with different flow rate but same temperature and there's the parameters for that for the outlets so for the pressure outlets in the documentation it says to define realistic conditions so for me I just like to define them as the same as the inlets uh, in terms of the mixture it of course it wouldn't be the same and um, because the gas would be getting depleted but there shouldn't be any backflow uh, in if you've got a continuous flow through the cell so the only time it's really used is at the start of the simulation sometimes you can get backflow occurring and it's just as long as you have something reasonable defined here and um, you won't get any crazy uh, any crazy results happening if there's a little bit of backflow at the start of the simulation that's all it's important for um, then for the anode terminal so here we're going to set up the outside face we're going to set it as a temperature boundary condition so constant temperature boundary condition and now uh, user defined scalars so the only thing we need to change is electric potential we change it to a value and we set it to zero so specified value and set it to zero. Now on the cathode terminal we're gonna set up similar thing we're gonna say 333 Kelvin and we're gonna do a specified value as well but we're gonna set it to 0 0.8 so that sets the voltage across the cell. This is these would be potentiostatic boundary conditions because you're specifying a voltage and then you're looking for the current. If you defined a specified flux that would be galvanostatic conditions and that would be you set a, a current uh, or a current density and then it would find the voltage across the cell at that current but we're going to use potential static so we, we've defined specified value with a specified potential of 0 0.8 volts so that's the boundary conditions defined if you wanted to change material properties you could go in here so you could change the catalyst, the current collector, the diffusion layer, which is the gas diffusion layer, 
and you can change the electrolyte. So if you were making your own simulation, you can change those, but we're not going to be changing those in this tutorial. So boundary conditions are done. Next, we'll move on to solution methods, solution controls, and things like that. Moving on now to methods, solution methods. I change my scheme to coupled, least squares cell based, and I change everything to second order. And what you can do is you can check this box to convert. Uh, it would normally have H2O, O2, and H2, but you can just set them all as one. Now I've set them all to second order, so I can move on to my solution controls. And in a lot of the literature, it's generally agreed that 0 0.3 and 0 0.7 for relaxation factors um, are good to have. Then for energy, 0 0.95. And set all the species relaxation factors together. Same thing, it just changes. So you can set them all at once, 0 0.95. And then the last thing to do is go into the advanced tab. And what we want to do is change the species um, the species cycle to be the F cycle, all of them. So we have F cycle, and we use this BCG stab. So this is biconjugate gradient stabiliz stabilization. So set them all to that. And we will set their termination criteria to 0 0.001, so two zeros in front of the one. Then for electric potential and protonic potential, we set them both to uh, be gradient stabilized as well, but we use a termination criteria of three zeros before, so 0 0.0001. And um, for capillary pressure, I found sometimes it gave me trouble, so I set it down uh, to two and water content as well, I just bring it down one notch. Those are very much open for interpretation. Um, it's pretty well agreed that you should use biconjugate grade, gradient stabilization for all of the species um, and for the ele electric and protonic potential. The capillary pressure and the water content were just personal ones that I have added in, but you're welcome to play around with those and see if, if you can get it to work without them. So. That's the controls set. Now, what we want to do is go into initialization. So, for initialization, one of the important features of a of a PEM fuel cell are the diffusion layers. And those diffusion layers are modeled as porous media. And because you're working with porous media, sometimes hybrid initialization can give a bit of trouble. Um, and this is just because hybrid initialization essentially is solving a simplified set of equations and those don't often take into account the porous media uh, changes. And what happens is you get unrealistic velocity fields in those porous media and it causes the simulations to sometimes crash. So if you want to be safe, you go standard initialization um, and you can just set your temperature to be 333 Kelvin, set everything just to be zero everywhere else, um, and you could initialize it there. If you want to use hybrid initialization, because it can speed up your convergence, especially on your first point, if you haven't already got a point to initialize from, if you want to use it, you can go into the settings and use maintain constant velocity magnitude. Um, and this is just a trick that I found uh, when I was looking up porous media modeling things. So you can use hybrid initialization if you have that setting on. Um, but if you're having trouble, then maybe go to standard. So I'll just initialize it there. Okay, next thing to do is to set up some uh, graphics, some contour plots, maybe a vector plot, and then also some outputs. Um, so we'll do that and then we'll run the simulation. To visualize our results, we will want to define some contour plots and that sort of thing. So we go into surfaces, 
um, we're going to create some new planes. So this one we'll call mid plane YZ. And I'm going to create a couple of different planes and then I'll come back. I now have a couple of planes to find. Uh, so at the middle of the inlet, the outlet, and then the three principal directions in the middle. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these planes in contour plots. So I'm going to make a new contour plot. So the first one maybe is pressure. I'll just do static pressure. And I scroll down to plane surface and I just select all of them. And I can save and display that. So it's only displaying the internal features because pressure is only defined on the internal features. It's not defined in the anode uh, and cathode flow plates. So if I make something maybe like temperature, so new temperature and set the variable of temperature and same thing, they should still be. So select them all, save and display. So now the temperature is defined everywhere um, and it's defined at a constant 333 Kelvin. So we've got a mid plane there. If we look down at the top, we've got a mid plane of the membrane and we've got a couple of slices through this through the cell um, and they'll get more interesting when we actually have some results. These are just our initialized values. So I'm going to set up a, a couple more contour plots and then I'm going to uh, come back and discuss them. I now have a couple of contour plots to find. So some of the important ones, for example, would be current density. This is obviously at zero now because it's just the initial values. Um, we can see velocity with the just velocity magnitude. It's done a basic calculation and it's got the uh, boundary layers in there and things. Just because we use that hybrid initialization, it's got a basic field. And if we go to our vector plot, we can see that it's helped it along. So this would be the anode inlet and it's moving in, it's moving across, and then it's moving out of our outlet that would be the cathode outlet there and um, so a couple of things some of the other ones to monitor might be water content of the membrane for example capillary pressure we also have and um, mass fractions of of hydrogen and mass fractions of oxygen relative humidity of your inlet gases is a good one to have as well so there's a few of them you can define um, to analyze the output depending on what you're looking for. The next thing to set up will be setting up our own custom uh, current density output. So I'll go through that now. Now we're going to create a couple of custom outputs. So we're going to go to report definitions, new surface report integral. And this is going to be the current at the cathode. So it's an integral and it's an integral of a user defined memory and the memory is Y current flux density. So the Y direction if you look over here is straight up and down in this simulation because of the way I define the geometry. So that's perpendicular to the cathode terminal surface that we defined earlier. So that's why we're using the Y current flux density rather than the X or the Z. Um, and so we need to then find that cathode terminal surface. Okay. So we have an integral of the current flux density over the cathode terminal. And if we just hit compute and have a look first, we can see that this is measured in amps per meter squared. But because we're integrating over an area, then that introduces times meter squared. So this is actually going to be reported in amps, right? Because it's amps per meter squared integrated over an area. At the moment it's zero. We haven't run the simulation yet. So we're going to keep that and just hit OK. So that's defined. The next thing we're going to do is another surface report, but this time is an area. And this is just going to be used as an area term to calculate a density later. It's basically we're setting up our own variable. So it's going to be the MEA, so the membrane electrode assembly area. So we need a surface that's the equivalent of the same area of our 
membrane electro electrode assembly, so our planar area uh, in the y direction. Uh, and if you remember from earlier, when we looked at in the meshing, we saw that that top surface of the GDL had been imprinted and it was no longer one face because the flow channels were imprinted into it. So we can't use the top face of the GDL because it won't actually, it's split into two different faces, it won't give a full area. So the next best thing is to use uh, the interior which is defined between the GDL and the MPL, right? So that's going to be the same area, it's just the next surface down and it's a full continuous surface. And just to check that, we can compute it and we'll see that it's 000 0084 meters squared, which is the same as what we said earlier. So we know that's all good, hit OK, that's our area made. The next thing we're going to do is a new expression and we're going to put in a report definition. We're going to put the cathode current in. We're then going to divide by the membrane area. So that's going to give us a current density because we have our current at the cathode divided by the membrane area, which is how a lot of th these fuel cells will get reported. So we then set up the current density and we create a report file and a report plot and we hit OK on that. And actually if we just look at it there and say compute you can see the expression is amps per meter squared. So we've got our units right there because this is amps divided by meter squared. Um, so that's just a quick check on that. Now in monitors, we should have an output file that has the current density in it. So that's all good. And we also have a plot which is going to be reporting the current density. So that's everything set up. We've initialized. We've got all of our outputs that we want set up. So it's time now to run the simulation. I can go to run calculation now. I'll set the number of calculation number of iterations just to uh, 200 and I'll just check case. So it's telling me to check my mesh probably because of element quality or something like that. Um, and then these warnings are uh, not a problem. So 200 iterations, hit calculate and I'll come back when this is all done. calculation is now done and we're just going to have a quick look at the residuals, the output that we generated and a couple of the plots. Um, so first things first, uh, the residuals. Um, one of the first things to notice is that there's quite a lot of oscillations in these are the velocities. So this is the gas. Um, the gas flow seems to be not settling down nicely. Probably that's due to the mesh um, it, it was quite a coarse mesh in the gas channels, so that could be solved by Im improving the mesh a little bit. Um, generally, it's not good to see oscillations in your residuals. It means that it's not converging properly. Um, but it's not too bad. You see the other residuals that aren't uh, defined by the gas channels, such as um, energy and protonic potential and things they're, they're getting down nice and low and, and get it's staying pretty staying pretty stable and now let's look at our our own definition our current density so the behavior was first couple of iterations it went straight up to around 2500 amps per meter squared um, and then it drops down slightly and then it stays pretty constant but it is uh, I would say it's increasing a very small amount what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that data I'm gonna post process it and I'll put it up on the screen now showing only from about iteration 10 onwards and you'll be able to see the trend that's happening in this part of the graph uh, a lot clearer there so that should be showing now okay so now looking at our contour and vector plots so 
first thing we want to look at is maybe current density so let's have a look and um, we're looking we're so, sort of just looking straight down at a cross section of the flow channels so go back to that view and we see uh, this is a pretty pretty normal thing to see we see a slight asymmetry so over on the right hand side there's a little bit more than on the left and on the right hand side is where we have both our inlets so it's inlet for the hydrogen and the oxygen on this side so it makes sense that there would be more on on this uh, in this area than there would be over here because you're getting depleted gases and then just in general that pattern of uh, current density in between those flow channels it, it, it's a normal one to see so that's nice have a look at temperature so it's a little bit warmer and um, you can sort of see the outline of those flow channels where it's a bit cooler um, but not not by much it's staying pretty reasonably um, uniform on 333 even here when it goes full red that's only 0.1 of a degree higher um, and over here is only a little bit cooler so things are looking pretty in line if you want you could look at mass fraction of this is a mass fraction of oxygen so obviously it's high here and it gets lower it gets depleted as it goes same thing with hydrogen should be higher on this side and then getting lower on that side and it is voltage should have just stayed the same so we set it to 0.8 and if we query it there it is 0.8 and 0 um, and it'll transition in the middle here so that's all for that uh, for the contour plots so that's it for setting up and running the model uh, we've net we've also looked a little bit at the uh, at the outputs it's given shown a few what's normal what's not I will provide some way of giving over the files I've used in this demonstration I'll I'll put it up somewhere you'll be able to get access to it maybe you'll have to email me I'm not sure um, so that's that's pretty much it um, thanks for thanks for watching and good luck with sim these simulations if you do any yourself